And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. And uh, I'm a little puzzled about who are the seven angels with the seven last plagues? What were the, the last seven plagues? What you have to realize when you read from 15 to 21 of the Revelation, which is the last chapter, they all are talking about the finality of the prophethood, the plagues on the world, the wars of the world, the fall of Babylon, which is the new Babylon you're in, which is the 18th chapter, the coming of the new city, which is the last chapter, the formation of the 144,000, the thousand years they'd reign with the Messiah, how they'd ride from this going through the whole thing. And they speak of from that period on, after they established in the 14th chapter, he says, look, for the 14th chapter talks about the Messiah Jesus. All right? And it goes right there. And Well, let me go back. The 13th chapter establishes who the devil is first. And it tells you about the beast and the second beast and the ten heads. Right? It goes past that there, goes into the second beast. It takes you all the way up. Then we cover the devil himself in the 13th chapter of Revelation. By the time we get to the 14th chapter, it starts to talk about the, the lamb, as they call him, the lamb, the gentle one, and 144,000 and how they would rise, and it goes through all of that, the new song that they would sing, which is the Quran itself, and how they'd be redeemed from the earth, and how they would be of men, of human beings, which is going all down to Revelation 14. In 14, certain angels who blew trumpets and certain angels who were angels of death. They called another angel in 18, another angel in 17, another angel. Then, after they established who these seven angels are in the 14th chapter, which represents the end plague and the end of the world, then they go on in 15th chapter and say, And I saw another symbol or sign in the heavens, great and marvelous, seven angelic beings having seven last plagues. That means these are the seven last plagues before the end of the world. Does this sound familiar? Sure it does. It takes you right back to Moses and Exodus and when Moses went into Egypt to try to get the Israelites out for the last chance. After he had warned them and spoke to them and preached to them and performed miracles, then his last chance was seven last plagues that was cast down on Israel which made the Pharaoh eventually do what? Let the children of Let Israel go. Let my people go. That's what Moses said. And the white man today do not want to let you go. He's enjoying persecuting you. All right. In this 15th chapter, these seven angels are the same seven angels that represented the plague that came to Moses. When you get down to, are you or are you not going to let my people go? Minister Farrakhan was talking about that recently, about the fall of America. The Uncle Elijah Muhammad spoke about it. The Holy Quran runs off a whole bunch of chapters, Zilzal, Qariya, Ariyat, Farik, a whole bunch of chapters near the end of the last juice that deal with the plagues of the world, the earthquakes, the cracking of the planet, the turning of asunder, all types of things. These seven angels represent the seven last plagues and judgments on this new city. Why? Because it takes you from 15, because that's one of the shortest chapters in the book of Revelation, right into 16, and then 16 takes you to 17, which establishes the power of the beast when they're released, and 18, the fall of Babylon. Again, the seven angels symbolize the seven last plagues before the end of the world, the seven wraths of the Most High. And I saw as it were a sea, right, of glass mingled with fire. You talk about judgment, hell, like looking through that crystal city like in the books of uh, Revelation in the beginning. And them that had gotten what? The victory over the beast. They already conquered over the beast. They're coming to the end of the world. And over his image. They don't look like him, dress like him. They're back in their white robes again. They no longer live in the image of the beast. No more jelly curls. And over his mark. He no longer live by his monetary system because his mark has to do with his money like he mentioned in 13. Anybody that don't have his mark will not be able to buy and sell. So that mark has to do with money, living under his money. We're going to have to break that because remember, his money gets its worth from our country. He gets his worth for his dollar from Africa. The gold, the platinum, the silver, the diamonds is coming from our country. We will no longer be under that. Go ahead. 
and over the number of his name. That's the 666. He had his time. 666 symbolizes his birth date, and let me go right through it, right quick. June 6th of 1966, in the Dakota House on 72nd Street in Manhattan, across from Central Park, directly facing Cleopatra's Needle, and they performed a necromancy, which is a resurrection of the devil, right up in Manhattan on 72nd Street, and Satan was released from Hades, from the pit, right then, after being tied. That was June 6th of 1966. Now, that may sound crazy until I start giving you some crazy coincidences. Now, here's one of them. They gave you all a fleet of movies in that period of time. Those movies were such as The Omen, Rosemary's Baby, The Omen 2, The Demon Sea, The Exorcist, Exorcist 2, Exorcist 3. They ran through a whole bunch of things, The Devil's Reign. Now, in these movies, they gave themselves away. The war that broke out, which is called a six-day war in Israel, around June 6th, right? right? They negotiated it at a place called Camp what? David. Now, you go back and watch that Omen movie, you're going to find out that Damien is in a camp called Camp David. Coincidence? Maybe. They say that he was born of a jackal. Correct? Correct. Right. Now, and the husband of the woman that gave birth to him was an ambassador who came from England to America. Correct? Correct. And was shot while in the Catholic Church in the back of the head. And according to the movie, the woman gave birth by way of a jackal. Yeah. Coincidence. The woman lost the baby and they replaced it with the demon seed. The Pope came here and gave a big speech in the Yankee Stadium on June 6th of 1966. Remember the word coincident means two incidents. First you get one incident, the second is a coincidence. Anything over co is no longer a coincidence. All this is a coincidence now, right? Now, in that picture of the omen, they show you that once that president was shot, that a man was at the graveyard and he took the responsibility for the little boy Damien. Then he was sent to Belgium, where he resides today. Coincidence that the computer, IBM, happened to come out of Belgium. And the master computer is called IBM 3666. And it's being programmed by somebody they won't tell the world who it is. And in his programming, he has managed from June 6th of 1966 to engage every continent in the world is in war. And every government is seeing financial fall away. And there's been a plague of new diseases and new drugs and all forms of pornography and degradation and evil since June 6th of 1966. Coincidence. Now, write IBM on the board, clear. And I want people to tell me, anyone who saw the movie 2001 Space Odyssey, I want y'all to see something. Because in that movie, the computer took over. Do y'all remember that? Yes. The computer took over. Now, watch when you write IBM. What comes before it? What comes before I? H. What comes before B? H. What comes before? M. L. How? How happened to be the same name of the computer that took over in the movie 2001 Space Odyssey? They said, how? Why are you doing this to us, how? How happens to be an Arabic word meaning I can do it. You understand? Now, all of these are coincidences. Let me go back over them. It's a coincidence that the movie Omen was about a man who was a politician who was a Catholic. He got shot in the head while trying to stab the devil boy, right? In the church. Coincidence. Then his wife's name is Jackie and Jackal and Jacqueline is the same. Coincidence. They happen to live up on 72nd Street in the Dakota House, which is a known St. Tonic building. Coincidence. The Pope happened to come in on June 6th of 1966, which would be 6666. Coincidence. And the Revelation 13 tells us it's the number of a man. Since then, there's been a rash of St. Tonic movies. One after another. Every year, in fact, three or four times a year, there's some new movie about the devil and how he wins. Coincidence. Somebody is being educated. And then there's a rash after 66 of satanic murders, satanic cults. You notice something about your satanic murders and satanic cults? You hear about any black ones? No. No. Why? Why is there no black satanic cults and, and uh, mutilations of animals and mutilation of bodies? 
Why? How come? Black people follow everything else the white man says. How come they ain't following down that path? And I'm not talking racism here. I'm talking common sense here. This is for real. Now, if you want to call the movie The Omen and the movie The Exodus and the movie, where did, where did they start the Exodus at? In Syria. Right? right? They started with the Adhan, the call to prayer. And a Catholic preacher comes all the way from an Islamic country, which don't even make sense, all the way back to America to try to exercise the devil out of this little girl. What's her name? Reagan. What's her name? Reagan. What? Can you say that one more time? Reagan. Now that's a heck of a coincidence, huh? Now think about that. Then the funny thing about it is, did the Christian preacher succeed in getting the devil out of Reagan? No. No. The devil threw him through a window and went on and possessed somebody else. You understand? Now, if you want to call all of these movies and all of these incidents coincidence, that's solely your prerogative. But I'm telling you, the devil is in the flesh. He came up out of the pit on June 6th of 1966, and the whole world is in danger. Not just white, black, Italian, Jew, Polish, Irish. The world is in danger. Whites who don't know that the devil's on earth is, is doing just as bad as you. You better believe it. Because they don't know. Don't think all white people know. All of them know they're the devil and they got a big conspiracy. They don't know. They find out gradually that what their people did is not normal. And they start saying, our ancestors did some treacherous and some cold-hearted things. Now, you want to take all these equations about the devil and call them a coincidence, that's your business. Now, let me ask you another question. What color was Damien, white or black? White. What color was Rosemary, white or black? White. Rosemary's baby? White. I mean, what does he have to do to tell you who he is? Tell me one movie where they depict a black man as a devil except for Bill Cosby. And they did that and then made him the biggest black person you ever known. They gave him a movie first where they depicted him as a devil in a comedy. And then after that, he became the number one black example. He had the best program and top rating the best. You call that, a, you, think that you think it's a coincidence? When they say, a senior hall got to go off television because he's too black? How can a person black be too black? I've seen some black people. I've traveled around the world. I've been to Africa and I've seen some black people and they're not too black for me. How can a man like Arsenio Hall be too black? I could see if they were looking at somebody with dreads, with a, you know, with some African culture, with an ox or a food on, sit up there with, you know, with, I can understand him saying, no, he looks too black. But I can understand a guy sitting up there with jerry curls, eyeliner on, that's too black? <laughs> that's too buckwheat, you mean? And they're worried about Arsenio Hall pull that man off television and got some of the blandest people up there. Why? I'll tell you why. Because you liked the program. Because he made you laugh. Because you watched it. A senior hall had a good program. It was funny. And the ratings were shooting up too high. You know Ben Bereen did what they call blackface? Ben Bereen. Brother. <laughs> what are you doing to us in 88? Here we take all this time to live. We fought up to the 60s and lost. We had a riot in the 60s. We lost. I wonder why we keep losing. You know why? Because we were very successful in the 60s in writing poetry. We just aren't no fighters, man. Stop fooling yourself. You be punching somebody and be trying to figure out how to stop. You ever engage in a fight with somebody and hope somebody break it up? When y'all got ready to get into a fight, y'all was ready. I'm going to duke him. I'm going to stop him. I'm going to nail him. I'm going to do this to him. I'm going to on the way to the fight. Your friends is cheering you on. Yeah. I'm going to do this. Get in the fight. You be mad at your friends because they don't break it up. That's how you are. You're not no killer. You're not a killer. You're not violent. You've been pushed in the corner. If you put a mice into the corner, he'll attack you. You've been pushed, and now you're acting crazy. You can argue. Now, black person, they give you a telephone fight. They get you on telephone. They curse you out. So if you're talking about meet me somewhere, I'll meet you. I'll be there. Just the opposite. If it's 10 miles this way, black person will go 10 miles the other. You know that. Don't fool yourself. You're not no fighter. Don't be sucked into it by no revolutionary movement, marching around the seat, and get your head bashed in. It ain't worth it. Do it the other way. You understand? If I tell you the other way, he'll know what it is. Anybody who don't understand the other way nowadays is crazy. Okay. One more question I want to ask you. Uh, what is faith? The word faith in Arabic means iman. It means having facts beyond any doubt. It does not mean believing in something you cannot prove. 
It means believing in something that you know has already been proven a fact. Not just don't say I have faith and it's blind. There's no such thing. Faith is when you put your trust in something because it has been proven. You follow? Yeah. How do you uh, attain faith? By looking up at night, take your mate. You have a mate? Yes. Take your mate and go to the mountain. And when it's dark, look up at the stars and realize how insignificant you are as an individual. You understand? In the daytime, just sit down on the grass and watch an ant hill. And watch a bunch of little ants moving. And then see how significant you are, on the other hand. And place yourself somewhere between insignificant and very significant. And you have step one to faith. You understand what I mean? Yes. She cry. Assalamu alaikum. I have a question. Um, how does Islam relate to... Uh, or contrast or compare with the Egyptian quote-unquote mystery system and traditional African beliefs like in Shango and the other... Okay. Ideology. When they use the word Shango, remember, Shango is just one of the deities on the Arishi who was once a human being. When you go back to Iliithi and Oyo, you come back to Oduduwa. You remember the name Oduduwa? Oduduwa is the founder of the Yoruba temple and Oduduwa is from the Yoruba language, from the Arabic for Wadud. Oduduwa and Wadud is the same. Wadud means the loving. The Yoruba people were originally Arabs who migrated to Africa from Ili'iti because they were idol worshippers when Muhammad came on the scene. When Muhammad then destroyed the idols, a lot of those Arabs did not just stop worshipping. They took their ancestral worship and moved deeper into Africa. You understand? So when you get to Shango, Obatala, Yemeya, Ogun, and many of the deities of the African Orishis, you're talking about human beings who died and did great things the same way me and you talk about Malcolm X, Dr. Martin Luther King, Marcus Garvey, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. If you come across a brother who's deep into reggae and you say Bob Marley, he almost sees Bob Marley as a deity in a subtle kind of way because of the inspiration, the knowledge, and the feeling that Bob Marley portrayed on him. And some people feel that way about James Brown. All right. So a lot of deity worship has come out of ancestral worship, which has come out of admiration for individuals. So the African faith does extend right into El Islam because the people in Africa were exposed to Tawheed, the oneness. Let me go back to Egypt now. When you get to Unkin Anten, not put Unk Aman, because it's Aten and Aman. Atin was a deity for Mushrik, many gods, and Amen was, uh, vice versa, Atin was one, and Amen was many. Okay? Unkin Anten, or Unkin Atin, was one who said, he acknowledges that with the Unk, the key to get to the other side, to eternal life, you will be met by one deity. Where, when they say Amen, you said Unkin Amen, you'd be saying, with the key of life, when I open the door to the other world, I will meet many deities. How did this happen is the question. When you go back to the Torah and get it into the Hebrew language, what happens is in the beginning they keep using the word Elohim and then they say Yahuwah Elohim. In the beginning was Elohim. The last two letters, Him, in Hebrew is pluralization just like Allahumma. The Hum means more than one. So they're saying, Elah, Allah, and Hum, and His heavenly host, which created a pluralization in the word Elohim, of which Jesus was a part of, why they say He was in the beginning, before Abraham, because a part of the Elohim, okay? When you bring it to a single, you get Allah or Elah. When in Hebrew they stopped using the name Elohim because the pluralization confused people, they started referring to Him as, O He Who Is. So they said, Yahuwah, which became known as Yahuwah, which became known as Jehovah. So therefore, some ancient descendants held on to the Elohim doctrine and still believed in the combination of the Heavenly Father and all of His angels, which is what we call the Arishi. When you say Obatala, you're really going Oba in Yoruba, Father Ta'ala, the Most High, Arabic, the Most High Father, Obatala. 
You see what I'm saying? It all stems back to the ancient Torah when they got confused between Elohim and Elo or Allahumma and Allah. When he's classified as a we, which includes him and all of his angels and creative forces, as opposed to as a he, which is the source or the essence of all creation. So Shango, Obatala, Ogun, Yemeya, and all our ancestors were nothing but our ancestors who we still respect but should not worship. You follow that? We should respect them the same way Christians go to a grave and respect by putting flowers down and Jews go to a grave and they put a stone on the gravestone to represent they were there. That is the same thing as going before Shango and them and in our religion we would put fruit out and such. Then later when it got into South America and they combined it with Christianity we started having saint this, saint that and it became another whole kind of practice. And then they had good and bad. Some were righteous and some became evil, so you get witchcraft out of that. Invoking evil spirits to do your bidding as opposed to righteous or just respecting your dead. Okay? And Rasulullah Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told us don't go to graveyards and put things down and you know, cry and weep because that's a form of ancestral worship. Give all that adoration to the Heavenly Father. Alright? Which is Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Okay? I hope I helped you. Uh, just another thing also, they talk about the, in the mystery system, the ten bodily fetters and that system of, of discipline, of the discipline in oneself and, um, you know, attaining that some of them both. Right, the ten principles they call them. Mm -hmm. They come from Tai Chi. Alright? A Tai Chi is an art of using the Latifa in Arabic. The Latifa is the chi point. The chi point is one inch below your navel. If you put your hand there, you feel there's a dent there. That's an energy center in the body, all right? Now, in the ancient Hindi practices, they had what they call the seats or the chakras. And these chakras were centered around certain glands, which they say gave off certain uh, electrical impulses, which resulted in aura change and energy. But them seven glands be broken down into two because you had two thyroid glands, you had the pituitary and the penal gland, so instead of having seven, you would end up with two, which they grabbed out of the ancient Egyptian doctrine of the seven seats of power that man had, which came out of the ten principles. So men learned to breathe properly, they would go down to the Nile, and they would have certain type of dances, which later became known as the death dance, because it symbolizes conquering death, and they went down at sunrise at the Nile, and they did these dances which later on became known as Tai Chi when the Japanese experienced it because they traveled as you know the Chinese and Japanese were traveling over to Egypt everybody knows that and they brought that over there and developed it the same way Kung Fu came from Kung Fu Te which is the name of a man they followed later on it became an art okay Thank you. do you uh, give me something on that would specify who the beast is that that's spoken of in Revelation and, and all the way back to even the beginning of the Bible. They use different words for beast, first of all. When you read beast, they have living creature in the language. And they just translate it as beast. Some books that went as far as saying dragon. Right? Mm -hmm. And dragon meant demon. A big demon. And the reason why they did that is because they wanted to make a difference between that gender when they're speaking of an animal as opposed to a man. Differentiate. You differentiate between when they speak of an animal and a man. And most of the time in the books of Revelation, when they're speaking about them, they're, they're using a gender that applies to a human being, the way they describe them. They're using whom and ulaika instead of haulaika. You know, and hua, it. They're not using it, they're using he and they as beings for the beast. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And so what happens is it depends on where in the scripture they are and what they're talking about. Well, you let the physical devil into the community as well as into a class. You know, like where you let them gown themselves in white. I have let the physical devil in the community inside the hearts of many black people. So what's the difference? Explain that. Many black people know the truth and still live a lie. Right. They are just as much of a devil as any white person with white skin. Right. If you know that you're supposed to be in white and you got on black, 
Tell me why you're doing it. All right, so now that would make you equal now if the woman that you're looking at in front of you happens to be white and right. she puts on white before you do, who's uh -huh. holier, you or her? Okay. You ain't answering the question. Who's holier, you or her? <laughs> she is. Okay, so then you answer the question, not me. That's pretty rough. Yeah, it's rough. <laughs> but it's true. Truth is true. I would like to know how I can help my mother, how I can help my mother's soul and, my, and her spirit for the simple fact that she's living with a devil, a so-called Jew, white had a baby wife. By not tormenting her about things you don't understand. Say that again? By not tormenting her about things you don't understand. That's how you can help her. Explain that? Yes. <laughs> if your mother married a Jew right. and has a baby by a Jew right. and the baby is there and you know they're already living together, right? right? And they consider themselves in love, right? right. All you're doing is making her uncomfortable by presenting her with is, truth. Uh, that into this Buddhism it. stuff. That's and uh, she started, you know, she's, she tells me she wants me to get into it. Because she, she says, you know, she does all these chants and whatnot. And she says this, this phrase, Nam Renge Kyo, or something like that. Uh -huh. Yeah, it's a vibration, yeah. And, and all kinds of stuff like money, cars, and all kinds of clothes, and all kinds of stuff is happening to her. Tell her, is that coming from the Most High? In other words, somebody that they worship tells them, if you chant this certain slogan, I'll give you the things of this world. Right. Tell her, the one we follow is telling us, if we be good, he'll give us the things in the next world. This world spans 80 years. The next world spans boundless time. Tell us, so all the wealth and accumulations of this world will perish. So go on and keep Yamo Rangi Kang Gang all you want. Um, my, my question is, uh, why is it um, important for the um, Nubian women and men here in the West to dress as Muslim? <coughs> because nowhere ever in Rasulullah Muhammad's khutbah to his first word has he ever given us an intercession from practicing what all the other prophets did. It said, this day have I completed for you your deed and called it El Islam. It was completed back in the year 631 because he died in 632 when he got his last revelation. No man can come along with no book after the seal of the prophets came which was Muhammad, the Ahmed, the Comforter, and the seal of the books, which is the Bayina, the Quran, and come and give us any writings and tell us that it is dominating the Quran, like the Hadith that the Sunnis live by. I live by the Kalim Allah, or Kalam Allah, the words of Allah. That is the books of its prophets, and not by the books of men who only write them for a prophet. So we dress the way the prophets dress because we have not got any message from Allah through any new prophet which would never come telling us it's all right for us to dress in the image of the beast or in the likeness of the beast which is what people are doing living in his image and after his likeness and receiving his mark. We're supposed to live the way Jesus lived, Moses lived and Muhammad lived Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and don't alter it or update it because no law or commandment gives us the right to do that. So um, all these uh, uh, advertisements for cl uh, clothing, uh, tight jeans, uh, tight um, uh, 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 sweaters, you know, uh, make, making the body, you know, um, appear uh, um, to everybody is, is not supposed to be done here at all by anyone. You're right. Listen to this. Genesis chapter 3, verse 7. When they first got seduced by Satan, and remember the Quran also tells Adam's descendants, be careful because the devil is going to try to seduce you and sway you. And the first thing he's going to do in seduction and swaying is make you take off your garments, take off your robes, all right? Now, if you look at Genesis chapter 3, that talks about the first contact that man and woman had with the serpent, the devil, all right? By the right. time you get to the seventh verse, which is after you already messed us around, it says, and the eyes of them both, meaning Adam and Eve, both of their eyes were open, all right? Yeah. And they knew that they were naked. So what did they do? They are so thick leaves together. And made? Made apron. An apron is a short-fitting garment. It's not a full-length garment, right? Yes. But over in the same chapter, when the Lord finally puts judgment on them, at 15, 16, 17, 18, and 19, He puts judgment on them. But now when He gets to 21, look what He says to them. Yes, He says, Unto Adam uh -huh. also, uh -huh. and to his wife, That's right. did the Lord Allah make... make Coats of skin to clothe yeah, them. When they first discovered their shame, they only covered part of their body. 
When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala stepped in, he told them to cover their whole body. How can, how can the uh, Christian churches, the people who say they, they follow uh, 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 um, the Messiah, um, justify wearing the clothes that they do? Because nowhere in the teachings of the Messiah did he address the way they dress because he thought, as he taught, that they was going to follow the law of Moses. He said the law came from Moses. And if you go back to the books of Moses and Abraham, women wore face veils. Men wore long white robes. When they describe Jesus in the book of Revelation, they say he had a long white robe down to his ankles. You follow? Yes. He thought that all the people who lived in his time dressed that way. It was that malicious demon Paul who took everybody off the teachings of the Messiah and gave them the worship of a man called Bar Jesus, which y'all might have heard about, who everybody now begin to find out is who people are worshiping when they think they're worshiping Christ. Jesus never gave laws on how to dress because he didn't come to do that. He came to give grace, which was forgiveness, and truth. To set the record straight, but he never told them how to get married, he never told them how to wash, he never told them how to eat, he never told them how to dress. Thus, he sent another comforter, which is what he said in St. John's chapter 16. He explained to them in that book why another comforter was necessary, because he said, because you believe not on me. Right? Yes, that's right. So let's look at it and see what it says. Where? where? St. John's chapter 16. Oh. Jesus said, these things have I spoken unto you that you should not be offended. Don't be upset. They shall put you out of the synagogue. And he knew they were going to leave the synagogues and become Christians, fall into this new religion. Mm -hmm. Now watch what he says. Yea, the time cometh, which means it's future, that whoever killeth you will think that he does God's service. Jesus is telling me the day is going to come, like Muhammad said, when death will mean nothing. To people. They'll think they're doing the right thing by killing people. We just kill some ragheads. We just kill some Arabs. Like it's a big deal. Like they serve an almighty by taking life. And he says in his commandments what? Thou shalt not kill. He doesn't differentiate whether it's Arab, Jew, Chinese, Japanese. He says don't kill. You didn't give life. You don't take it. Let's go on. Number three. And these things will they do unto you because what? They have not known the Father, nor me. He said, the reason why they're going to kill you, because they don't know Allah, and he separated himself, nor me. He didn't say, know my Father as me, know me as my Father. He said, because they don't know my Father, Abby, nor me, and they don't know me, the Messiah. Then what did he say? And he said, but these things have I told you, that when the time shall come, you may remember that I told you of them, and these things I said not unto you at, at the, beginning. the beginning. I didn't teach you about these things. He said, when I first started talking to you guys, I didn't tell you all these things were going to happen. Right? Because what? Because, because I was with and, you. And the prophecy was that nothing would happen to any of the disciples while he was there. He said, so nothing would happen. But now, I go my way to him that did what? That sent me. Which would translate that made me his Rasul, made me his apostle, sent me. He's going back to someone who sent him. If Jesus was God, how could he be sent? Who sends God anywhere? <laughs> how can you be sent somewhere if you're God? You send people if you're God. You don't get sent. And if you are God and the Father and the Son, I know you're not going to send yourself. It's stupidness. It's ridiculousness. Go ahead. But now I go my way to him that sent me. And none of you ask me, whether going thou. No. None of y'all bother to ask me where I'm going. But because I said these things unto you, sorrow filled your face. Then he goes on. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient or better for you that I go away. Why? For if I go not away, the comforter will not come unto you. But, but if I depart, I will send him now Aren't the Holy you? Spirit comes from the Father as an angel. Jesus can't send Holy Spirit. You see that? Yes. <laughs> okay, go ahead. And when he is come... What would he do? He will reprove the world of, what? of sin. Now, is Jesus going to reprove the world of sin? No. Or is Jesus going to send a... Let's just backtrack and go out of his mouth. Not out of Reverend Ribb's mouth. Let's go right out of Jesus' mouth. Jesus said that when the Comforter comes, what would he do? 
He'll reprove the world of sin. Did Jesus say he himself was going to do this or that he was going to send someone to do it? Now go back and read it. Jesus said in St. John chapter 16 verse 8, And when he comes, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin because they believe not on me. So he talked to his own disciples. He said, you're going to suffer for one reason and one reason only. Because regardless of what I tell y'all, y'all still don't believe. And how do you know they don't believe? I'll tell you simply. Because the day after the crucifixion, when he supposed to came to the upper room eight days after seeing Mary Magdalene, they didn't believe. They were scared when Jesus came in the room. They were supposed to believe, according to their teachings, that he died on the cross for their sins and resurrected. Correct? That's their belief. So how come when he walked in the room, they were scared if they believed that it happened? They didn't believe it. That's why they said, if I don't see no holes in his hands, if I don't see no nail prints, I'm not going to believe it. But what was Jesus talking about for three and a half years when he was teaching them? If they get to that point and the first thing that comes out their mouth, if I don't see no nail prints, I don't see no holes in his hands, I'm not going to believe it. That means did they believe Jesus when he was teaching them? No. Did they believe Jesus after his so-called crucifixion? No. When did they believe Jesus? They didn't believe Jesus. His disciples never believed. They doubted all the way up until he met them. He told them to cast their nets over the side of the boat to get fish because they fished all night. They didn't recognize him. And then one of them said, that's Jesus. And then Jesus told some of them to come. As Peter and John came towards Jesus, Jesus started asking Peter questions. Are you going to take care of my flock? Are you going to take care of my flock? He knew they didn't believe. He knew they doubted. This is right in the book of St. John, the last chapter. He knew they didn't believe. Go ahead, let's see what he says. Of righteousness, because I go to my Father. Where is he going? Is he going back to heaven to be the Father? No. Is he going back to his throne as God in heaven? No. Where did he say he's going? To his Father. And what? And, uh, and ye you see, see me, me no more. He said, y'all ain't going to never see me again. Now that's kind of funny because he said he's coming back. Correct? But when he comes back, the disciples ain't going to see him. The next time the disciples will see him is in the place that he said he went to prepare for them in heaven. When he comes back to earth, they won't see him. Go ahead. Of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. Now here's the part that answers the question about the clothes. Why do people not know how to dress, eat, think, walk, talk, Christ-like? Because he said, I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. He said, all the things I'm supposed to teach you, you're not ready for. I have many things to teach you, but you're not ready for them. So, I'm going to send someone who will. What? However, so, however, how be it? How be it when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. Keep with them he, that's right. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, and shall show it unto you. This is what Jesus spoke about would happen. That man is going to come, the he who had the Holy Spirit, is going to come after him, and he is going to pick up the teaching. Now, who came after Jesus? One prophet. I want y'all, anyone to tell me, what prophet in history came after Jesus who brought a book, who taught law, who taught people how to dress, he taught people to prostrate in prayer the way Jesus fell on his face in the garden and prayed. This man told people to fall on their face and pray. The way Jesus was gowned in Revelation with a white robe, this man told them to wear a white robe and a turban on their head. The way Jesus did not eat pork, this man said don't eat pork. The way Jesus kept the Sabbath and the preparation of the Sabbath on Friday to Saturday, this man kept the preparation on the Sabbath. What man came in history after Jesus that you can find through all the history of the world who was classified as a prophet who successfully taught people about Jesus and how Jesus was glorified in heaven and in earth and how he was the word of Allah, the spirit of Allah, the Messiah, son of Mary, the son of man. What other man did that? None but a man named Muhammad who came in Arabia. None other. There has never been one in history and there won't be any. He came with the message that Jesus said he would bring in this chapter, right in 16, but people still don't believe. Still don't want to accept it. Still don't want to dress right. Still don't want to stop eating pork. Still don't want to fall down on their face and pray. So they're on their path to hell. 
I have an aunt, and she considers herself a saint. She lives in Michigan, and, and the people there, you know, the Christians there are just very, very, very deeply. Well, you know, it's scary sometimes. You go in their church, and they do all sorts of things in there. And um, she said she was a saint, so she was talking to my mother on the phone. We recently had um, a stream of deaths in our family, and um, they all seemed to come, like, at an even time span apart. And then my mother got sick, and she said that she spoke to my other aunt, who's a saint, too. They both spoke to be saints. And they were speaking in tongues, and, you know, they just have this feeling. Hey, can you explain tongues to me? <laughs> I mean, you, you yes, touched I can. on it earlier. I think, it, I think it's funny, you know, that they go through all of that kind of stuff, because if you look in the books that they talk about, the books of Luke, where they get it from, which is the book of Acts, right? Mm -hmm. In the second chapter, this is when they start talking about what tongues is. Mm -hmm. And they say, and when the day of Pentecost, which really would have been translated, when the 50th day came, so they stuck the word Pentecost in there and left it. The word Pentecost is from the word like pentagram. Mm -hmm. And Pentecost just means the 50th day. Mm -hmm. 50 days after Jesus left, is what they're really saying, was fully come, right? Mm -hmm. They were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind. And it filled the house where they were all sitting. Okay? They were all all the disciples sitting around mm -hmm. and there appeared unto them cloven tongue I mean splitted tongue mm -hmm. like as a fire not fire but like fire and it sat upon each of them okay mm -hmm. and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with somebody read that word other other tongues the Christians keep saying they keep saying speaking in tongues they just take the word other out and throw it away. Mm -hmm. The reason why it says other tongues, as we're going to read, is because these people all spoke one dialect, one language. So watch what happens. Other tongues. Right? Mm -hmm. As the Spirit gave them utterance. Mm -hmm. And there was dwelling, and where were they at? And Jerusalem, Judahites, or Jews, devout men, out of every nation under heaven. So in Judea, there was religious Jews who had been spread throughout the world, gathered there. Now, when this was noised abroad, or made noted by everybody, the multitude came together. And there was confounded because, they were confused with men, because that every man did what? Heard them speak in his own, what? Language. The speaking of tongues is that people were confused when they saw the disciples because everybody knew that they spoke one language being that they were Galileans. They spoke only Hebrew. Now they came down all of a sudden with the power to do what? Speak other languages. Now watch. Seven. And they were all amazed and marveled saying one to another, Behold, are not all of these which speak Galileans? That's the meaning. Let's look at this. Isn't all these men that are speaking to us in these different languages, aren't they all Galileans? In other words, shouldn't they just be speaking one language, Hebrew? Mm -hmm. Then it says, And how hear we, every man in our own tongue, not in tongue, gibberish, in our own tongue, which is mentioned back in 6 as language, wherein we were born. How come we hear these men now speaking in our languages? They're not speaking gibberish. They're supposed to be speaking Hebrew. How come they speak in Greek and Aramaic? But not only that, they're literally going to tell you what languages they spoke. Goes on in number nine. It says, Parthian, which is Arabic, because Parthian is Egypt. And Madis. And Madis is Persian, which is the language Pharisee. And Elamites. The Elamites spoke Phoenician. And the dwellers in Mesopotamia, which spoke Chaldean, where Abraham came from. And in Judea, which spoke Hebrew. And in Cappuccania, which spoke Greek. And in Pontus, which spoke Arabic. And in Asia, which speaks another dialect of Arabic. And in Bulgaria, and in Pampalia, and it goes on, it says, and in Egypt, and in parts of Libya, Egypt, Arabic, Libya, Arabic, Cyrenus, Greece, and strangers of Rome, Latin, Jews speaking a language of Phoenician again, and what are they doing? And uh, uh, Pasalitis, which are Greeks. Now, Crete, which is Greece, 
and Arabian, Arabic. And then it says, we do hear them speak in what? Our, the wonderful work of God. You see that? Speaking in tongues has nothing whatsoever to do with what the Pentecostal church is pretending. Speaking in tongues according to the books of Acts right here is the power that disciples was given to speak all of those languages of those places. That's why they didn't translate that. They left all those funny big words so people wouldn't understand. Those are the names of places where people speak different languages and that's what those disciples came down doing. Speaking different languages, not, I repeat, not speaking gibberish. And then they use Corinthians to support their own teachings about the coming of spirits and that's in Corinthians chapter 12. It says, now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. I don't want you to be ignorant about the spiritual gifts. Ye know that ye were Gentiles, this is Paul, so he's talking to Gentiles, carried away unto the dumb idols, that's how you were led. He said, you know you Gentiles were worshiping rock, and you were led that way. He goes on, wherefore, I give you to understand that no man speaketh by the Spirit of God, call it Jesus curse because that's what people are saying so he's saying no one who speaks about Jesus will say that he's cursed well if Jesus was hung on a cross then he was cursed remember these books were revealed after Jesus was gone years after and that no man can say that Jesus is the Lord but by the what Holy Spirit now there are diversities of gifts but the same spirit one spirit like I was trying to explain to that brother early and there is a difference of administration but the same Lord. And there's a diversity of operations, but the same God, which worketh in them all. One God, Wahtahu, La Sharik Allah alone, no partners has He. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with it. Now, and now He's going to explain the Spirit. For the one, His one, is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom. There are certain men who was given the Holy Spirit and they spoke wise things like the prophet to receive revelations and stuff. And another, the word of knowledge by the same Spirit. Some were doctors and physicians and told men what things cured certain sicknesses in that time. And another, faith by the same Spirit. Some men don't have much knowledge and they're not good speakers but they just endowed with a lot of loyalty and faith to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And another, the gifts of healing by the same Spirit. And certain men had the power to heal. To another, the working of miracles. Certain men could change the weather. Like Jesus raised the dead and Elijah raised the dead. Certain men had the power to raise miracles. To another, prophecy. Certain men had the ability to predict things that was going to happen. Write things like John did in the book of Revelation. Which foretell the coming of the end of the world and the signs we should watch. To another, discerning of spirits. Certain men had the power to push the demons out of people who were possessed. To another, diverse kinds of tongues. Which the word diverse means the ability to speak different languages. And that's the one that the disciples received. The seventh one, the ability to speak different kinds of tongues, which I just got to read in Acts 2. Right? And the last one, just because we're here. To another, which is the eighth form of the Spirit, the interpretation of tongues. Some men who had the ability to translate tongues that they don't speak. They heard these men speaking in their tongues. This is what tongues is about. It has nothing whatsoever to do with this fiction that the Pentecostal church is duplicating from African traditions, bimbes, and voodoo worship of people banging on drums and chanting and people getting possessed. They have that in South America, they have it in Africa, they have it in Haiti, and there's a ritual where they play drums and they chant and play tambourines, and somebody gets possessed, starts acting like ducks and stuff, and they put blood and they have chickens. That's what they're talking about. They have got what happened at the day of Pentecost seriously mixed up with some devil worship because they follow the unholy spirit, not the holy spirit. So what they're talking about is coming from the devil. If the saints you're talking about say spirits are talking to them believe me you can get a Ouija board and spirits will talk to you they don't have to be good spirits dead people are constantly trying to make contact with the living and they will speak to you and what they do is they always give you some good advice first so they can lure you wicked spirits give you good advice first and they lure you into devilishment and then they take possession of your soul so that according to the Bible I hope I answered it 
According to the Bible, they're not speaking about tongues that they talk about. They're speaking about languages, and they tell you what languages they are, and which spirit, which percentage of the spirit, which is the seventh percentage, is the diverse kinds of tongues which the disciples spoke on that 50th day after Jesus left. Please tell the world, stop this gibberish about speaking in tongues and foaming out the mouth and, and hitting each other with tambourines and all. And please cut this out because it's a sin, a serious sin. You have been listening to The True Light, sponsored by the original Tents of Kedar, located at 717 Bushwick Avenue in Brooklyn, New York. You are also invited to attend the Questions and Answers class every Sunday from 1 p.m. to 6 p.m. in the Hall of Knowledge at 548 Hart Street in Brooklyn, New York. And now, more profound than ever before, the Pamphlets of Peace, authored by the Master Teacher and Spiritual Guide, Es Sayyid El Imam Isa El Hadi El Mahdi, covering such topics as who's who on the planet Earth, the resurrection, who was Noble Drew Ali, who was Jesus' father, who was Marcus Garvey, St. Paul, disciple or deceiver, and much, much more. Also to aid in your spiritual growth, we have a beautifully crafted hand-woven prayer rug designed by Es Sayyid El Imam Isa El Hadi El Mahdi. We also have a large assortment of prayer beads, Nubian and Sufi oils and incense. The original tense of Kedar would like for you to write or call us and let us know how the true light has changed your life. Remember, above all things, truth is true. That was the first five verses of Surat al-Alaq, originally revealed to the Prophet Muhammad as the first chapter. It is today recorded as the 96th. As translated by as Sayyid al-Imam Isa al-Hadi al-Mahdi, it reads as follows. O seal of the prophets of Allah, Muhammad, by the supreme sovereignty of your sustainer and creator, you are being ordered to read by beginning with the name of your illustrious sustainer, who is the creator of all things. He, Allah, created all human beings of a cell separating. So read, because your sustainer is most generous. He, Allah, taught human beings what they would have never known. over all things.